So welcome again, everyone. My name is Rebecca Hartman Baker. I lead the user engagement group. I'm here with my two colleagues, Charles Lively and Helen He, and they are both members of my group. And uh, anyway, we're going to present to you today this crash course in supercomputing. It's kind of like a giant fire hose uh, that you're going to have to drink from, but hopefully you'll get some stuff out of it. Okay, um, let me get started. So this is kind of an overview of what we're going to do this morning. Um, so first, we're going to talk about parallel programming concepts and sort of basics of supercomputer architecture. And then we're gonna get into parallelism and MPI. And MPI is a, is a library that you use uh, to write parallel codes on a distributed architecture. We're gonna have a little break so that you can have time to get, your, get yourself back into the game. Uh, and then we're gonna go talk about MPI collectives, which are just advanced M MPI functionality. Uh, we're gonna have time for Q&A and hands-on. Uh, where we're going to do these exercises of computing the best number in the world pod. And then we'll have lunchtime. And if you are here at Berkeley Lab, and if you signed up for the Computing Sciences Tau Day celebration, you get pizza. Okay. Uh, and then after lunch, we're going to go into OpenMP, which is another uh, way to parallelize your code. And by the time we get there, you'll understand what we're talking about. And then we'll talk about combining OpenMP and MPI, and we'll have a little break. Then we'll have some time for interactive exercises, hands-on practice, and then we'll adjourn at four o'clock. Okay, uh, so we're gonna talk about some logistics here. So we recommend that if you, even if you're here in person, you go ahead and join that Zoom, but be sure to mute so we don't get feedback. Um, so, the, and if you're, when you're on the Zoom, please put your name in there, like your actual name. Um, we we, we kind of want to know like who attended. And so if your name is, you know, Fluffy Kitten 123, that doesn't really help us to know, you know, who that was. Um, you can turn on a captioning and you can view the transcript by clicking that CC button. Um, you're going to be muted upon joining Zoom, uh, but you can unmute if you want to ask a question. Um, and then, uh, but we really recommend that you ask your questions also in this Google Doc. Um, we we don't really like the Zoom chat because it's ephemeral and uh, people won't be able to see it later. So uh, instead use our Google Doc to uh, do the chat or, or to ask questions, sorry, and then uh, one of me or Charles or Helen and then some of our other colleagues will help answer those questions. And then we're going to have a short survey afterwards and we really like your feedback so that we can know how to make this course even better next time. Okay, so I'm assuming that Google Doc link is going to get put into the chat if it hasn't already. Yeah, yeah go ahead and repeat it. Okay, so Additional logistics. So after the event, we will make available slides and videos. Uh, we do put ca professional captioning on all of our videos, so it'll take it take a little while for those to, to get on there. Um, and then we also encourage you to register for the OpenMP uh, monthly training series, which started in May, goes through October. You can learn a lot more about OpenMP. Um, we're only on session three, so you can catch up with sessions one and two uh, on the videos and exercises that are available. And then we're also going to have a, an intro to CUDA programming training soon. Um, so we'll let you know when that gets scheduled. Slides are already posted for today. Oh, okay. Slides are already posted, so that's good. So, so go retrieve those slides, um, and then you'll be able to follow along. You'll also be able to uh, just do these things like the how to uh, get clone and all of that stuff. Okay. Excellent. So anyway, this is how we're going to access the uh, Git repository that has all of our exercises as well as answers to all of our exercises available. Um, and then we also have listed here some handy dandy reference pages for you about running jobs and how to run interactive jobs stuff like that. Okay. 
Okay, we have a compute node reservation for this course. So um, you have, if you have an existing NERSC account, you've been added to the N Train 3 project. If you don't have an existing account, then you should get a training account. If you haven't done that already, uh, you can go ahead and do that. Your training account will be valid through July 10th. Um, we have a reservation, we have some notes uh, from 10.30 to 4.30 today. Um, and so this kind of shows you how to use that reservation. Um, and then outside of our time period of this reservation, you won't actually be able to use the reservation uh, flag because the reservation won't exist. And if you try, your job won't, won't run. Okay. Finally, I just want to remind everyone of the nurse code of conduct. So if you're a nurse user, you already signed and agreed to our code of conduct. Um, and so basically we are all bound by the code of conduct as collaborators. And there are five main themes, team science, service, trust, innovation, and respect. And so we agree to work together professionally and productively towards our shared goals while respecting each other's differences and ideas. Um, and then we should all feel free to speak up in order to maintain uh, this healthy environment. And remember, there are resources. So if you have any issues or concerns, you can contact us at nurse-training at lbl.gov. Um, you can also take a look at the Code of Conduct. You can search for it on the internet with Nurse Code of Conduct. You should find it. Um, if there's any concerns, there are ways to report uh, issues. And we welcome any reports so that we can uh, you know, maintain an, uh, a, a positive environment that is inclusive and collaborative. Okay, so all that out of the way, now we're gonna get started. So we're gonna talk about parallel programming concepts first. Now, something you're gonna learn about me is I like, I like to joke, I like to keep everyone awake. I really like it when people laugh at my jokes. So one thing that um, I have been doing for a long time is I like to make pictures in, in my presentations that are related to the concepts but aren't exactly the concept. Just a little surprise, a little visual surprise. So in this case, this is a picture. We have uh, some blinds and the, that, uh, that table like connects all of them and it's actually very apt for what we're gonna talk about. But anyway, you'll see. So first we're gonna talk just kind of an overview of the concepts of parallelization, serial versus parallel and some parallelization strategies. Okay, so what is parallelism? So generally speaking, it's, it's a concept that lets us work smarter but not harder by simultaneously doing multiple things. So the idea is you can divide a task or a problem into smaller subtasks that can be executed simultaneously. And in doing so, you can do your work more efficiently and therefore quicker, okay? Now this applies in regular real life too, not just in computing. So we're going to really uh, talk about the real life stuff first, okay? So does everybody here, uh, you know what lasagna is, right? And you probably kind of have at least a concept of how to make a lasagna, even if you've never made one. I hope that's true. Anybody here not know what lasagna is? Okay, can't can't find out about the the online people, but statistically, everyone in here either knows or they're not or they're not admitting that they don't know. That's fine. So let's say we want to make a lasagna. Okay, this is a task that we can break up into parallel tasks. So some parts of it, like uh, making the sauce um, and assembling it and baking it, we can do them in parallel. Some of them, though, we have to do it in a particular order. So, uh, for example, we need to, let's see if I have more here. Okay. We need to make the, uh, the sauce, right? And we need to prepare our, like, cheese that goes into the lasagna, right? Both of those can be done in any order, right? However, when we are making a lasagna, we have to assemble it and then bake it, right? We can't bake it and then assemble it and then make the sauce, right? So those are what we would call 
sequential tasks. And then the other is what we would call parallel tasks, right? Things that we can do in any order are parallel. Things that have a, a specific order are sequential. So that's kind of, that's the concept here of serial. You have to do them in a particular order. Parallel, you can do them in any order. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. We've got a little uh, diagram here. So the idea here is, you know, if we had, if, if we just had one uh, CPU, then we would have to do all of our tasks in, in order, although the order doesn't matter. However, if we can do it in parallel, then, uh, then we can do them all at the same time. We can get our work done quicker. Okay, so in my example about lasagna, so our serial tasks are, um, we gotta make the sauce, we gotta assemble the lasagna, we gotta bake it, okay? We're not gonna make a salad with our lasagna, we're gonna make a whole dinner, okay? Uh, we gotta wash our lettuce, we gotta cut up our vegetables, we gotta assemble the salad. Uh, but any of these things we can do uh, in parallel, right? Like we can make the lasagna, and we can make the salad. Those are independent tasks. They have nothing to do with each other, right? It just, so it doesn't matter, like, do I make lasagna first? Do I make the salad first? It doesn't really matter because we're going to get to the same place. Okay. Um, so you could make a graph. Does anybody here like to make really big meals, like, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, for example? Anybody besides me? Okay, I've got one person here today. Okay, we got two. Okay, so I don't know about y'all. But when I'm making something really big like that, if I have like a certain time that my dinner has to be served, I work back from that, right? So I'm like, okay, let's see, I got to put the turkey in at this certain time, right? So it has to be ready at that time. And then while it's cooking, then I can make the other stuff, right? Like you're planning it all out. So you could do something like this. This is maybe a little hardcore compared to like what you would normally do. Normally, I just kind of get the back of an envelope, but I just kind of write stuff on it. But you can see this is actually a graph of the dependencies of all of the work that I'm going to be doing here uh, when I'm making my lasagna dinner. Okay, so um, like I was talking about here, so we got to um, make our sauce, we got to make our cheese, you know, grate it up, and we got to cook our noodles, and then we assemble the lasagna, right? So all those things can be done independently in any order, uh, but there is what we would call um, a synchronization point here at the assemble stage, right? We can't uh, we can't move on until all three of those things have been finished, right? So similarly with our vegetables and stuff for our salad, we got to wash them, we got to cut them up, and then we can assemble the salad, right? Everybody understands, right? You can't like assemble the salad first and then cut it up, right? That doesn't make any sense, right? You have to do these things in, in the correct order. We're gonna, I added garlic bread to the menu, by the way. So we're gonna prep our garlic butter. We're gonna cut our bread. We're gonna, and then we're gonna spread the butter on the bread and then we'll bake it and then we'll have garlic bread. Okay. So like I said, uh, I like to make, this is what I would make when I'm uh, uh, cooking my uh, my you know Thanksgiving dinner. I kind of have a plan, like okay. Uh, so if you notice, this was color coded. So all the kind of purple to red stuff is the lasagna. All the green stuff is the is the salad, and all the kind of yellow and orange stuff is the garlic bread. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by making my sauce. It has to simmer for a while. Then while it's simmering, it's doing kind of a background process, right? That I'm not really involved in. And then I can do the stuff like grating up the cheese, cooking the noodles, that kind of thing. And then assembly happens just before five o'clock. And then I put the, put it in at five o'clock, put it in the oven, it's baking until six. At that time, I can um, go ahead and chop up my vegetables. Well, wash them and then chop them up. And then I can, after I'm done making the salad, I can make my garlic bread because it also needs to come out of the oven at the same time as my lasagna, right? And so in that way, I have kind of, I've taken all of my tasks 
and I've parallelized them in the best that I can for one person, right? Uh, and that's that's how it works. Okay, um, are there any questions so far about, about this? If not, we'll move on. Is it all kind of making sense? Okay, great. So, um, like I said, I have kind of optimized it for one person, right? Like this is the best parallelism for one person. But um, what we could do is we could actually have multiple chefs. So I don't know about you all, I have a sous chef. He's 17. There's some things we still can't trust him with, but mostly he can do everything that I can do in the kitchen. Uh, keep him away from the sharp knives though, so. Um, so, right, so I could have him doing some of the work instead of me doing the work, right? And and then together, we could further reduce the amount of time that it takes to make our dinner. Um, and this is the exact concept that we're using in parallel computing. We're going to get, instead of people, obviously, we're going to get computer processors, and we're going to get more, you know, multiple computer processors to do the work that we need to do in our scientific algorithm versus in making food. Okay? All right, so now we're going to talk about something else, and you're going to be like, Becca's a really bizarre lady today, like, what is she doing? Okay, um, so we're going to talk about jigsaw puzzles. So anybody here like jigsaw puzzles? Anyway, all right, we got a few, good. Okay, sort of, maybe. Okay, so let's say we want to do like one of those really big ones, like the, the 10,000 piece version. Those are fun. And let's say that, let's say for the sake of argument that everyone completes puzzles at the same rate, which is, I know, not true, but for this argument, we're going to say that it is, and that it takes T hours for one person to complete an N-piece jigsaw puzzle. So the question here is, how can we decrease the wall time to completion? And wall time, what I literally mean is there's this clock on the wall, and you know time is advancing. So how can we decrease the total amount of time that it takes before our puzzle is finished? Okay, so I have a few ideas. So one is we could have multiple people at the same table, right? So if you have a buddy who likes to do uh, do puzzles with you, then um, you know both of you are at the table and you're doing the puzzle. So how long is it going to take two people? To, uh, to complete the puzzle. So we said it takes T hours for one person. How, how long is it gonna take for two people? Any any suggestions? T divided by two. T divided by two, okay, any other ideas? Okay, it's gonna take close to T divided by two, but it's probably gonna take a little bit longer, right? So why would that be? Any ideas? Have you ever done a puzzle like with your sister or something and she's like sitting there with her elbow on the table and her elbow happens to be like right on the piece that you need? Latency. There's latency, yes. There's resource contention. There's communication, right? You have to say, hey, get off that piece already. I need it, right? So there's some extra work that you have to do in order for two people to do a puzzle that you wouldn't have to do if it was just one person, right? Right, okay. Yes, I see somebody saying Andal's Law. That is exactly right, but we're, we're not talking about it in that formal way. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we have this idea of how long it would take two people to, to do a puzzle. What if we change the number of people to four people? So we've got four people around our table. It's gonna take what? About T over four with a little bit of overhead, okay? What if we have 5,000 people around our table? How's that gonna work? Is that gonna be good? Good plan? Could be done even faster? No, okay, I've got somebody really shaking their head no here. Why? Um. 
I mean, assuming all 5,000 people want an equal contribution on the puzzle, it's going to take forever for them to communicate with each other. And... Yeah, yeah, exactly. They can't even like fit around the table. Or if they did, then you probably wouldn't be able to reach the puzzle, right? If you had a 5,000 person table, I'm just trying to think what that would look like. And each person would do about two pieces. So uh, yeah, it would it would probably take longer for 5,000 people than one person. Okay. Um, so next. Okay, now I have an idea that you might think was inspired by the pandemic, but it's uh, been around for a long time. So here's my other setup. So instead of having everyone around one table, I'm gonna have multiple tables. So this is the social distancing version of the problem. Um, and so I'm gonna give each table n divided by p pieces each, okay? And let's say for the sake of argument that those pieces are mostly just all pieces that are together in the puzzle. It's not like random pieces, okay? So, um, so what's the impact on our uh, wall time to completion here? So we could start with thinking about two people. So we've got a, a, a table here and a table here. And you're doing your part of the puzzle and another person's doing their part of the puzzle. Um, what, what's gonna happen here? Everybody's like, whoa, what are you thinking? Anybody, anybody wanna, yeah. So the problem is that the puzzle pieces need to see the other puzzle pieces to know where they go. Ah, okay. You're right. So there's gonna be there's gonna be disconnections, right? I'm I'm like I say, I'm assuming that like all the puzzle pieces that I give you are are connected with one another, basically though. That's impossible without knowing how the puzzle is already put together. Well, I mean, you have the you have the picture. Everybody has a copy of the picture, let's say. But yes, what you're saying is 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 correct. Like you're gonna have one part of the puzzle. Someone else is gonna have another part of the puzzle. Maybe like where does your puzzle begin versus and end versus other people's parts of the puzzle? That's true. That's true. But what happens when we want to actually assemble the whole puzzle? It might be difficult, huh? I think I see somebody on the chat telling me things, so let's go with that for some. What are you saying on the chat? Oh, the puzzle parts might fall apart when you're answering from one table to another. That is so true, Tony. I was really thinking though, we have like this giant spatula. <laughs> have you ever had like one of those giant, like my son has one and it's like for pancakes or something, but it's like huge. And so you could just take your giant spatula and you could take your part and you could walk over to the other place. But that's actually the point I was trying to get at, right? Is now, instead of saying, hey, get your elbow off of that piece, you have to stand up and walk over to some other place and say, hey, may I please have this piece? Or here, here is a giant spatula worth of the puzzle that you can connect into your puzzle, right? So communication is extremely expensive, right? Um, we don't have as much resource contention because there's nobody else with their elbow on your on your table, right? But we do have a, a really expensive cost for communication. Okay, and so it would take us about, uh, you know, t over two time if we had two people doing it, except there's this overhead, this additional overhead, right? Of uniting these two parts of the puzzle in the final step. Okay. Let me just check my chat here one more time. See if we got any good ones. Oh, okay. Thanks, Helen. Okay, so let's move on to the next thing. Okay, so I have a, an even better idea. Or do I? Okay, this is one of those landscape puzzles, you know, where they have like, it's really picturesque and and they have like a big mountain and there's the sky and there's a stream and a tree and a meadow, all that kind of stuff in my in in my puzzle. So 
let's say I divide up my puzzle by those types of features. So like you work on the mountain, you work on the stream, you work on the sky, you work on the meadow, you work on the tree, right? What's the impact on our wall time, our communication and our resource contention? Any ideas? Um, so I guess my first question is, do you think this is like evenly balanced? Yeah. Yeah. The sky could be a huge part of the puzzle. Right, right. The sky could be a huge part of the puzzle or maybe the mountain. I don't know. They say, right, you don't, it, it art in order to make a beautiful picture. You don't want to have like equal proportions, you, have, you know, kind of unequal proportions that makes it more dramatic, right? So our, our wall type to completion is gonna be limited by the biggest sized component of our puzzle, right? Okay, um, how about um, communication and or resource contention? Anybody have any ideas on that? Yep. One piece is part sky and part mountain. Yes, one piece could be part sky and part mountain. How do we decide where that piece goes? Right, right. So that's gonna be some resource contention. We're also gonna have a lot of communication around those, uh, those boundaries between the two parts. Okay. All right, well, my friends, you may be saying to yourselves, what in the world is happening? Um, but uh, this is actually going to come into a, a clearer understanding when we get to the next part. So right now we're gonna talk about parallel algorithm design. So like, how do you make a parallel algorithm? And uh, this is the way, this is the best way to do it as far as I'm concerned. So you remember this handy dandy acronym, PCAN, um, and that stands for partition, communication, agglomeration, and mapping. So partition means you want to decompose your problem into fine-grained tasks, okay, small pieces, uh, to maximize the potential for parallelism. So we're not we're not judging whether these pieces are going to actually prove useful for parallelization. We're just dividing it up into small pieces, okay, uh, and then we will determine the communication pattern among those tasks, which basically means dependencies, right? Like the, like the graph that I've made of making our lasagna dinner. Um, so we're gonna determine the communication patterns. And then um, from there, this is where we start actually making judgments about what is a good idea to parallelize and what is not. So we're gonna agglomerate these into coarser grain tasks um, to reduce communication requirements or other costs like dependencies, right? Because if there's a dependency, then you're going to be waiting on that other thing to happen before your thing can happen. Okay, and then finally, we're going to map. We're going to assign these tasks to our processes, um, and we're going to think about the trade-off between communication costs and concurrency, right? So if I do the whole puzzle myself, there's zero communication costs but it's gonna take me a lot longer than if I have a buddy who helps me, 